Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to this edition of the PG Classes, an initiative of Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. This is in continuation with our classes on long and short cases, which come for a PG exam. We will today discuss the anesthetic implications and management in a patient with aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis is characterized as a high risk index for cardiac complications during non-cardiac surgeries. The perioperative risk associated with AS during non-cardiac surgery depend upon its severity, clinical status, and the complexities of the surgical procedures. A critical analysis of old and new data from published studies indicate that the significance of the presence of AS in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery is not overemphasized. So please, may I welcome today May we invoke the blessings of God Saraswati Namastubhyam Varadi Kamarupini Vidyarambham Karishyami Siddhir Bhavatume So today, before we start our session, may I request all of you to mute yourself while the lecture is going on. We are live on the YouTube at the rate ISNHQ. The questions asked by the teachers to the audience can be answered in the chat box. You can post your questions in the chat box, which will be taken up at the end of the session. All the lectures are available at ISA website. To take such an important topic, we have eminent speak, uh, chairpersons like Dr. Satyajit Mishra. He is professor and head of the anesthesiology and critical care at Ames Bhubaneswar. Sir is Dean Research at Indian College of Cardiac Anesthesia, examiner for the fellowship, <laughs> sector edi uh, editor, cardiothoracic anesthesia for JOACP. He has received several honors and awards like ICTA for the best research paper in 2020, YG Bhojraj Award in 2013, KPR Young Anesthetist Award in 2011, Pope's Award in Cardiac Anesthesia and Neuroanesthesia in 2012 and 10 respectively. He has more than 75 indexed articles in international and national journals. His area of interest is echocardiography, cardiovascular pharmacology, inflammation, depth of anesthesia, pain, advanced hemodynamic monitoring, outcomes in cardiac surgery, ECMO and simulation. Dr. Vikram Behra is additional professor at Ames Bhuvneshwar. He is faculty in charge of pediatric anesthesia, Ames Bhuvneshwar, and faculty in charge of PG academics. He is member of hospital transfusion and member of liver transplant uh, committee, Ames Bhuvneshwar. He is member of several associations like ISA, IPA, and IAPC, and member of Aura. He is winner of Dr. Vrinda Van Singh Memorial Award by Association of Physiologists of Odisha. Winner of N.C. Koshik Memorial Award of, by ISA Chhattisgarh, and he has 35 national and international publications. The uh, case will be presented today by Dr. Premanshu Ghoshal, who is a junior resident at Ames Bhuvneshwar. So over to you, our respected chairpersons. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Parul, for the generous introductions. It's uh, indeed a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be um, uh, presenting this uh, PG Academics today in front of uh, such an esteemed audience. We're going to discuss a very important uh, heart disease that is aortic stenosis. It's less discussed uh, in PG Academics because the focus is heavily on mitral stenosis, but aortic stenosis is as critical and as important as mitral stenosis and uh, uh, confers adverse outcomes uh, during the perioperative period. Uh, to present uh, the case today, uh, we have uh, with us uh, our final year resident, Dr. Primakshu. And uh, with me as moderator is uh, additional officer in our department, Dr. Vikram Mehra. Without wasting any further time, I would uh, request Dr. Primakshu to go ahead and uh, present the case for uh, benefit of all. Thank you so much. I was distracting and unclear. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
So there is some. Uh, so the voice is not clear, very clear, but you're visible. Uh, could okay. you take your screen to the main uh, complete screen, the slideshow, sir? Yeah, we'll put it on slideshow. Is the voice better now? Um, a uh, slightly better, sir, but still there is not. Uh, it's not very clear. There's some uh, disturbances. And okay, just give us a minute. Right, sir. How's the voice now? Uh, still some disturbances, sir. There, sir. Okay, we'll just ask our right. Okay, can we request everybody else to mute themselves, please? Sir, we've muted everyone, sir. You can start. The voice is Thank very you. clear now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So a very good evening to everyone. I am Dr. Pramanshu Ghoshal, junior resident in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care in Swoobnesar. Today I'll be taking you through one interesting case. Mrs. X, a 26-year-old homemaker from Bhubaneswar, presented to our hospital at 36 weeks of gestation with chief complaints of breathlessness since last four weeks and chest pain for the same duration. She has been in safe confinement for last one week and now call given by obstetrician for termination of pregnancy through lower section caesarean section. Coming to the history of present illness, she started feeling breathless since last four weeks, which was insidious in onset, progressive in nature, aggravated on minimal exertion like going to washroom, but relieved with rest. She also complains of easy fatigability. She also had occasional squeezing pain over left side of the chest, which started four weeks ago, which was sudden in onset, progressive in nature, and aggravated on exertion and relieved with rest. However, there is no history of fever, cough with expectoration, syncopal attacks, palpitation, hemoptysis, headache and blurring of vision, and joint pain in childhood. Coming to the past history, as per her, she was diagnosed to have some cardiac disease two years back. Detailed reports were not available with her on admission to hospital. She has no history of tuberculosis, bronchial asthma, diabetes, hypertension, seizure, or any thyroid disorder in past. Obstetric history. Her gestational age on presentation as per last menstrual period was 36 weeks, and now she is admitted in this institute for past one week. Medication history. She has now been started on tablet metoprolol 12.5 mg twice daily and tablet furosemide 10 mg twice daily since last one week. Surgical history. She doesn't have any significant past surgical history. Personal history. She is taking mixed diet. Her bowel bladder habits are normal. Family history. No other family members have such symptoms or diagnosed to have any heart disease. So to summarize my history points, 26-year-old primary gravita at 36 weeks of gestation with history of heart disease presented with breathlessness on minimal exertion, chest pain, easy fatigability for four weeks on diuretic and beta blocker now for past one week since admission to the hospital. Now coming to the examination. After obtaining consent, patient is examined in a well-lit room in lateral, left lateral decubitus position. General appearance of the patient corresponds to near-term pregnancy. Her height is 162 centimeter and weight is 70 kg. Pallor is present. Icterus, cyanosis, clubbing, and lymphadenopathy were absent. Bilateral pitting pedal edema present till ankle. Vitals. Pulse rate 70 per minute, regular, low volume, no radioradial and radiofemoral delay. Blood pressure 100 over 70 millimeter mercury 
measured in right upper limb, measured in left lateral decubitus. Respiratory rate 24 per minute, thoracoabdominal type. Saturation 96% at room air. Jugular venous pressure not elevated. Peripheral veins are visible for access. Now coming to the airway examination. There is no obvious facial deformity. Mouth opening is adequate, that is three fingers. Hydromental distance is more than 6.5 cm. Malampati grade 2, no loose tooth or denture, no restriction of neck movement. Spine examined, so exaggerated lumbar lotus is present and intervertebral spaces are well palpable. Now coming to the systemic examination. On auscultation of cardiovascular system, S1, S2 heard. Her systolic murmur heard just after S1, which is of levine grade 3, best heard over aortic area, that is right second intercostal space at lateral border of sternum, best heard at expiration with diaphragm stethoscope with patient sitting up and leaning forward with radiation to carotids. No other added sounds audible. <clears throat> other systemic examinations, respiratory system, bilateral normal vesicular breath sounds audible, no added sounds present. Central nervous system examination has mental functions intact, no focal neurological deficits. Obstetric examination on inspection, abdomen is uniformly distended, umbilicus central, linea nigra and striae gravitarum present. So uh, thank you for the case presentation and the findings. Uh, would you like to summarize your case? Yes, sir. sir. My patient is a 26-year-old primary gravida presented at 36 weeks of gestation with breathlessness, chest pain, and easy fatigability for four weeks, and now has been admitted for safe confinement for past one week, currently on beta blocker and diuretic. <clears throat> Any other positive findings? C was a diagnosed case of heart disease in past. And on any, and any on examination, examination, any positive findings? On examination, C has low volume pulse and there is heart systolic murmur of Levine grade 3, which right. was audible in aortic area with so, radiation to carotids. So a young female, 26-year-old female, first time pregnant, presented with 30, at uh, 36 weeks of gestation with some features of exertional dyspnea and chest pain with a finding of uh, a systolic murmur over the aortic area with a low volume pulse. Uh, what would be your provisional diagnosis in such a case? My provisional diagnosis would be valvular heart disease, probably aortic stenosis in a 26-year-old primary gravita at 36 weeks of gestation. So what are the positive findings in support of your diagnosis? From the history part, she was already diagnosed to have some cardiac disease before pregnancy. She has now presented with breathlessness, chest pain and easy fatigability, which for which she is currently on beta blocker and diuretics with her symptoms in improved. Then in clinical examination, there is low volume pulse and on auscultation, there is at least Levine grade 3 murmur, hers, ejection systolic murmur heard over aortic area. So, right. so uh, these all findings and the clinical and the clinical findings and the history probably point to a diagnosis of aortic stenosis. Uh, what would be the differential causes of dyspnea in a pregnant woman? Differential diagnosis of dyspnea in pregnant woman can be of cardiovascular origin, can be of respiratory origin, can be due to pregnancy per se. Coming to the cardiovascular system, it can be uh, due to uh, any valvular pathology or valvular heart disease. It can be due to ischemic heart disease. <clears throat> in the respiratory system, it can be due to pneumonia can be acute respiratory distress syndrome. And as pregnancy per se, it can be due to the... So the uh, pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome is less likely. It can be exacerbation of pre-existing respiratory diseases like asthma or COPD. COPD. Right? Yes. Yeah. And? And uh, for preg uh, as pregnancy per se, it can be due to the gravidotodus pushing on the diaphragm. It uh, can be due to anemia of pregnancy. Right. So these are the various differential diagnoses of breathlessness. Uh, you gave a negative history of uh, chest pain. In which conditions uh, would you get uh, encounter chest pain in pregnancy? Chest pain in pregnancy may be, again, due to cardiovascular cause, due to respiratory cause. In cardiovascular cause, uh, in the cardiovascular causes of chest pain, it can be due to ischemic heart disease. It can be a valvular heart disease causing compromised 
cardiac uh, coronary perfusion pressure or it can be zero it can be in this like in this present case in as it, you can have angina pain so the patient has presented to you with chest pain so as is one of the causes the other causes would be pericarditis would be a cause of chest pain you can have pulmonary hypertension which can be a cause of chest pain pulmonary hypertension with right ventricular hypertrophy can cause chest pain right so yes. all these are the differential diagnosis of chest pain in a pregnant woman ischemic heart disease in such a young woman is very unlikely right yes sir. so you have to look at the age of the patient before you make a differential diagnosis the others are more likely but ischemic heart disease is a very unlikely common unlikely cause of chest pain so if at all you have to say it, you have to say it at the last now uh, you said that the patient has got a systolic murmur over the aortic area and by aortic area you mean in the left in the right second intercostal space yes sir. parasternal area what would be the other differential uh, diagnosis or other causes of uh, uh, systolic murmur in pregnancy it can be a flow murmur due to hypertonic circulation in pregnancy it can anemia be, anemia of pregnancy anemia of pregnancy it can be due to hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy it can be due to mitral regurgitation so how do you differentiate based on clinical findings a murmur due to aortic stenosis a murmur due to anemia and a murmur due to hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or a murmur due to mitral regurgitation because they are all systolic murmurs <clears throat> a flow murmur uh, due to anemia in pregnancy or hypertonic circulation will not be more, uh, more than grade 3 uh, grade 2 i would i would say it would not go more than grade grade 2 okay because when you are going to grade 3 and above you are probably looking at a uh, uh, not so innocent murmur you are looking at a pathological so if you have a systolic flow murmur within a grade 2 then it is most likely due to a, a systemic cause like an anemia or a hyperdynamic circulation and so on and so forth. right yes sir uh, for uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy uh, there will be no radiation to carotids and the murmur heard will be in the left lower part of the chest but here in our patient it is heard in the aortic area plus there is radiation towards carotids we can also confirm with some maneuvers and uh, for mr that is mitral regurgitation the radiation will be towards the axilla uh, so uh, between a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy murmur and a murmur due to as what clinical test can you do or what maneuver can you do that discriminates a murmur of aortic stenosis from that of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy we can do valsalva maneuver with valsalva maneuver uh, there will be accentuation or increase in the intensity of murmur of hocm but there will be decrease in intensity of aortic stenosis murmur why is that in valsalva maneuver there will be increased intrathoracic pressure so venous return will decrease so because as venous return is decreasing there will be less flow going across the aortic valve because of the less flow across aortic valve the gradient is also decreased so the murmur of aortic stenosis is decreasing but for hocm as the preload is decreasing the uh, obstruction is uh, getting more is becoming more so there will be more obstruction more increase in uh, murmur in hocm right thank you dr bikram so dr pranman so you have made a provisional diagnosis of aortic stenosis how, how are you going to confirm your diagnosis so for confirmation of uh, aortic stenosis i would like to go for 12d echocardiography so can you tell us what are, what will be the echo findings in a patient with aortic stenosis was an echo done in your patient before starting medications uh, after admission in this hospital the patient was evaluated and echocardiography was done and based on that echocardiography findings and clinical findings he was started on beta blocker and diuretics so can you tell us the echo findings in this particular patient yes sir uh, so uh, this patient's echo finding is like uh, the patient is having moderate aortic stenosis with bileaflet aortic valve with uh, leaflet calcification there is aortic valve area of 1.3 cm square and uh, peak by mean gradient across aortic valve is 48 by 30 mm mercury at uh, 70 beats per minute heart rate and uh, the peak flow velocity across aortic valve is 3.5 m per second uh, however there is uh, uh, there is uh, no uh, lv systolic uh, dysfunction uh, the ejection fraction is 60% there is left ventricular hypertrophy grade 1 diastolic dysfunction no regional valve motion abnormality and there is no evidence of pulmonary embolus or clot or vegetation 
Very good. So how do you classify aortic stenosis based on eco findings? Based on eco findings, uh, first, according to the aortic valve area. So here we are for the benefit of the postgraduates, the question asked here is how do you classify the severity of aortic stenosis according to the echocardiography findings? So aortic valve area, if uh, it is between 1.5 to... So there will be three things that you will use for classifying the severity of AS as mild, moderate or severe based on three parameters. One is the aortic valve area. The other is the mean pressure gradient across the aortic valve in systole. And the third is your peak flow. Peak flow. So according to the aortic valve area, if the area is between 1.5 to 2.5 centimeter square, it is mild. If it is between 1 to 1.5 centimeter square, it is moderate. And if it is, if it is less than 1 centimeter square, it is severe. According to the mean pressure gradient across aortic valve, if it is uh, less than 20 millimeter of mercury, 5 to 20, 5 to 20, it is mild. If it is between 20 to 40 millimeter mercury, it is moderate. If it is more than 40 millimeter mercury, it is severe. According to peak flow across aortic valve, that is AV max, if it is uh, less than 2 meter per second, it is mild. If it is between uh, 2 to 3, it is uh, moderate. 2 to 4. 2 to 4. If it is more than 4 meter per second, it is severe. Right. Very good. Uh, uh, was an ECG done in your patient? Yes, ECG was also done. Can you tell us the findings of in ECG findings in a patient with moderate AS and severe AS? In my patient, there was left ventricular hypertrophy in ECG. Along with that, there were some... What would be the features of left ventricular hypertrophy on ECG? Uh, the summation of R wave in V1 and V2 and S wave in V5, V6 is more than 35 millimeters. 35 millimeters. Small squares. Or 35 small squares. And there are some other criteria also. So you'll have a left axis deviation. That means the lead one and the lead three are leaving each leaving other. Each other. Okay. So you'll have features of LV hypertrophy with left axis deviation. What other ECG findings can be there? Uh, if the R wave in V5 or V6, if it is more than 26 millimeter, uh, or the R wave in AVL is more than 20 millimeter in absence of left anterior fascicular block, or if there is, uh, these are features of left ventricular hypertrophy. Apart from that, we can also have some arrhythmias and AV blocks. Very good. Why would there be blocks? Because of the juxtaposition of aortic valve with the AV node and junctional fibers. There can be extension of calcification from aortic valve towards the AV node. And if there is, uh, you may also get an AV strain pattern if, because there, um, because this patient had uh, uh, pain. So there can be also ischemia and an AV strain pattern. That means ST and T wave abnormalities can also be there. But if you do a drop T, it, there may be, it may be negative. So drop T may be negative. So that's how you distinguish it from an acute coronary center. Oh, right. Yes. So uh, Dr. Premansu, what are the various etiologies of aortic stenosis? Etiologies of aortic stenosis can be congenital or acquired. In congenital, it can be due to bicuspid aortic valve. In acquired, it may be of rheumatic origin because of rheumatic heart disease or maybe degenerative. In your patient, uh, which etiology is most likely given her clinical findings and echocardiographic findings? Uh, as in echocardiography, it is already written as bileaflet aortic valve. Most likely my patient is having a bicuspid aortic valve etiology. And she had a negative history for rheumatic fever as well as any joint disease. Right? Yes, That's yes, sir. But aortic stenosis of rheumatic uh, origin is most common in our country. In our country. Yes, that sir. always differential diagnosis should always be kept. Yes. So, uh, Brahman, so can you tell us about the pathophysiology of aortic stenosis? So, here the question asked is what are the changes, morphological changes in the ventricle as well as physiological changes in the ventricle as a result of the aortic stenosis? Yes. Uh, due to the stenosed aortic valve, there will be increased pressure overload and compensatory change on the left ventricle, there will be left ventricular hypertrophy first. Because of left ventricular hypertrophy, there will be a, a diastolic dysfunction which will get originated in left ventricle. And because of this long-standing diastolic dysfunction, because of the long-standing back pressure changes, it, it may extend into uh, pulmonary congestion also. And later, it may form into left ventricular systolic dysfunction also. So to summarize, initially, there is a 
compensatory hypertrophy to the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and uh, uh, to the left ventricular valvular obstruction rather. And the compensatory hypertrophy is very important if you want to understand the physiology. You have to use the Laplace law here. The compensatory hypertrophy is very important because it minimizes the wall stress. It minimizes the wall stress and therefore it minimizes the myocardial oxygen consumption in the hypertrophic ventricle. So that's a very important compensation that is taking place. So this compens, but unfortunately this compensation comes at a cost and the cost is increased LV stiffness leading to a diastolic dysfunction. And with long-standing AS, the, the, because of the diastolic dysfunction, there is a progressive increase in the left ventricular and diastolic pressures, which will finally manifest with increased LA pressures and pulmonary congestion. So many times you will have patients coming with pulmonary edema and VQ mismatch due to, due to long-standing AS. And you have to be very careful in the fluid administration in such patients. Even though they are preload dependent, you have to be very judicious in the fluid administration. Now, uh, the compensation takes place until a certain point in time after which the compensatory mechanisms fail. So uh, initially, the LV ejection fraction is maintained, but with long-standing AS and as the gradient progressively increases across the aortic valve, the uh, LV uh, systolic decline starts, the LV starts failing. And this is the time patients start having dyspnea. And once they are having dyspnea, the time to uh, uh, the longevity substantially decreases when they are in failure. It's on a median of six to eight months once the uh, LV failure sets in. So these are the these are the various pathophysiological changes that take place in a patient with aortic stenosis. Okay. So now that we have understood the pathophysiology of aortic stenosis, you have told that uh, the patient was started on beta blockers and uh, curious. I just want. Dr. Parul, I would just like to uh, ask you a question. Till this point of time, are we clearly audible or is there any uh, problem? So you, are, uh, so you are clearly audible, but could we make a session more interactive? May I request the audience to type their questions or their queries in the chat box and we can communicate it to the eminent uh, teachers we have today. Sure. So uh, that I even you said because I think you said at the beginning that the questions will be at the end of the discussion. Maybe so they are, they are not uh, Sir, so far we have not received any questions. So I'm encouraging them to post some questions. Sure, Fine. sure. We will take it up. Once we finish this discussion, we will yes, take sir. up all the questions right. to the best of our ability. But I just wanted to confirm whether the voice was coming in clear or not. Voice is absolutely clear, sir. Thank you. Uh, so uh, so my, uh, I was just asking... So we have understood the pathophysiology of aortic stenosis and you told that the patient was started on beta blocker and furosemide. Can you tell us why these two drugs were started in this patient? How it helps the patient. So why the pharmacology that was started? How does it help in the patient's symptomatology? That is the question. Beta blocker, it will uh, prevent increase in heart rate. It will rather decrease heart rate. What will happen with decrease in heart rate is it will also come down on the myocardial oxygen demand number one. And number two, because of decrease in heart rate, it will also allow the diastole to get sufficient diastolic filling time. So, uh, uh, the gradient across aortic valve will not get exacerbated. So, thus, it will help in both ways. And uh, regarding diuretics... Uh, so, beta blocker will reduce the heart rate, thereby decrease the oxygen demand. Demand. Uh, de uh, demand. Okay, sir. And what about furosemide? Uh, furosemide, it will decrease the preload. So, again, uh, uh, by decreasing preload, it will prevent pulmonary congestion from happening. Right. So, when you are starting these drugs, a patient with NYHA grade 3 and uh, she was, uh, you know, towards the late pregnancy, there will be tachycardia. So, when you are starting these drugs, the drugs were started obviously by the cardiologist. What are the considerations in starting these drugs? Uh, so, what, my, what I mean to ask you is, at what dosage do you start and at what is the clinical uh, endpoint for titration of these drugs? Uh, the clinical endpoint would be targeting a heart rate between 60 to 80 beats per minute and a normal sinus rhythm. Uh, and, and you start at the lowest possible dose because you have to understand that you don't want the negative inotropy of the beta blockers because you need to maintain the contractility. At the same time, you don't want to give a very high dose of the diuretics because you don't want to deplete the patient uh, from the preload because these patients are very preload dependent. So you have to start at the lowest possible dose of the diuretic to relieve the congestion and to improve the NYHA grades. And you have to start at the lowest possible dose of the beta blocker, titrating it to a heart rate of resting heart rate of between 60 and 80. What other medical advice would you give to this patient? She has been for safe confinement. So what other medical advice would you give to this patient to minimize the symptoms? Other uh, uh, medical advices, 
uh, would be uh, number one to maintain hydration uh, to uh, so the patient has to have an adequate rest minimal physical activity and salt restriction salt restriction, salt restriction always raises the blood pressure and that's always a problem okay uh, this patient was previously asymptomatic you said that the patient came around one month back with all these features of uh, breathlessness uh, and chest pain and so on and so forth. So, the, so for much of the pregnancy, the patient was asymptomatic. What happened in the last few days that the patient suddenly became symptomatic? What I mean to ask you is how pregnancy influences this particular valvular heart disease. What physiological changes of pregnancy will worsen, will worsen symptoms? the symptoms? So the question here is what changes occur in pregnancy that worsens uh, the pre-existing valvular heart disease? or the symptoms of the pre-existing valvular heart disease because she was relatively asymptomatic for a long period of time and in only in the last month of pregnancy it would be uh, uh, she became symptomatic so what changes occur in pregnancy that worsen the uh, uh, symptoms of aortic stenosis so uh, for that uh, i'll uh, i would like to tell about the cardiovascular changes in pregnancy there is increased blood volume and cardiac output up to 40 to 50 percent so increase in blood volume of the uh, blood volume will increase the preload so if preload is increased again the gradient across aortic valve increases number one and number two in pregnancy there is also increased heart rate around 50 to uh, sorry 15 to 20 percent so again increase in heart rate will decrease diastolic filling time and also increase myocardial oxygen demand third is due to the effects of progesterone there will be decrease in systemic vascular resistance. Again, the gradient across aortic valve will increase. So th these three cardiovascular changes will actually exacerbate the signs and symptoms related to aort aortic stenosis. Yeah. So to summarize, all the things that go against uh, decreasing the symptoms in AS are happening in the patient, pregnant patient. Number one is the maternal tachycardia that uh, takes place during, especially the last trimester of pregnancy, the heart rate increases are uh, um, uh, exacerbated. So tachycardia is always uh, bad in a hypertrophied heart, uh, beat uh, hypertrophied for any any condition. Then the second thing that happens is your uh, uh, the blood volume, the net blood volume increases. Therefore, the flow that is presented to the stenosed valve increases. And once the flow that is presented to the stenosed valve increases, the gradients increase across the valve, which worsens the symptoms. And the final thing is because of the effect of progesterone from the placenta, you have a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance. Now, uh, as we will discuss later in the anesthetic management, uh, the one thing that is avoided is a drop in the systemic vascular resistance. So the three things that are uh, counterproductive to the management of AS is happening in a pregnant patient, which is why she presents with a worsening of the symptoms towards the later stages of the pregnancy. So uh, what investigations would you like to do in this patient? Already you said that uh, ECG has been done and uh, 2D echocardiography has been done. Okay. Would you like to do any more investigations or they should be sufficient for you to go ahead with your anesthesia? Uh, so already the selective tests regarding this case has been done, have been done. I would like to go ahead with some routine tests that is complete blood count and renal function test and uh, blood grouping and cross matching. So here I'd like to take the, um, uh, just, just a counsel for, uh, the, there's a lot of postgraduates that are attending today's uh, webinar. So when the uh, uh, examiner asks you what tests would you like to do, always divide the tests into screening tests and indicated or selective tests. That always gives a good impression. So the screening tests that you would like to do are the routine tests like your hemoglobin, your the blood grouping and cross matching, your complete blood count, the RFTs and LFTs. The goal of a screening test is always to look for any problem that was not detected during either the clinical history or the examination. So that's the screening test. So you run a battery of tests just to pick up any abnormality that you might uh, that might change or influence the plan of anesthesia or the consequent surgical management. So divide it into screening tests and selected or indicated tests. Indicated or selected test is like this patient with a cardiovascular disease. As an indicated test will be uh, a 2D echocardiogram that is uh, routine in a patient with a cardiac disease. Suppose a patient is taking anticoagulation, then an indicated test would be to do a PT or an INR, which we may not do routinely. So these are the things. So always divide this answer into tests, screening tests, and tests which are indicated or selective tests, selective testing. Uh, would you like to do an X-ray in this patient, uh, which may add on to your diagnosis, diagnostics? No, sir. Uh, no, sir. Uh, because first of all, uh, she is pregnant, and number two, there is no add-on value of chest X-ray. Uh, to the well, uh, yes, there is no add-on value, but in case you do a chest X-ray, you will have to take care to put an abdominal shield. 
uh, there are a lot of procedures where fluoroscopy is employed in the pregnant woman and one of them is a transcatheter valve deployment in in a in a medically refractory patient who's uh, who with with heart failure symptoms where these are where the uh, options are limited so either you go for a surgical aortic valve replacement or you go for a transcatheter aortic valve replacement if you're going to do a transcatheter aortic valve replacement you will have no choice but to take her to the fluoroscopy suite and put an abdominal shield and do the transcatheter aortic valve replacement okay but that's besides the uh, context of this thing so if at all uh, the question comes uh, to the postgraduates would you like to do an x-ray if it's a pregnant woman uh, then at least say that you will use an abdominal shield if it's really indicated but otherwise in this particular case beyond a 2d uh, yes we have already discussed that we have said that rft and that includes the electrolytes to see the potassium levels because the patient is on diuretics uh, so uh, in this particular case an x-ray will not be of much additional value so now given these uh, investigations given the patient's profile given the diagnosis how would you like to risk stratify this patient? And what are the goals of risk stratification? So, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, risk stratify this patient according to the NYHA classification. Uh, this patient has uh, been started on beta blocker and diuretic. Can you tell the full form of NYHA? New York Heart Association. Okay, that is for patients with cardiac disease. Cardiac disease. Right. Uh, so, this patient is coming in New York Heart Association class 2. That is, uh, she is presently she is in class two. Present. When she presented to the hospital, she was in class, class three. three. With the one week of diuretic and beta blocker management, she has now improved her NYHA grade to class two. So now, can you tell the NYHA grading and the risks involved? Sure, sir. Uh, NYHA class one, uh, uh, there is uh, no dyspnea and no limitation of activity. Uh, NYHA class two, dyspnea on ordinary activity and slight restriction of. Uh, 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 slight restriction of function. NYHA class 3, dyspnea on less than ordinary activity and NYHA class 4, dyspnea even at rest. Why is the NYHA grading important in this patient? How does it help in risk stratification? Uh, NYHA class 1 and class 2, it uh, predicts a perioperative major adverse cardiac events risk up to 1 to 5 percent. And if it is, and if it is class 3 and 4, the risk is around 5 to 15 percent. Okay, so NYHA is a good way to uh, evaluate the risk. Uh, so if it is in lower NYHA grades, NYHA 1 and NYHA 2, the risk is less than 5%. Whereas if it is NYHA 3 or NYHA 4, the risk of perioperative adverse event, major cardiovascular events, goes up to 5 to 15%. Any other risk stratification tool is there? There are in patients with cardiac diseases. Uh, there is WHO, uh, uh, WHO pregnant, specific to pregnancy. Specific to pregnancy. There is modified WHO uh, risk stratification or risk classification. There are also other risk stratification. Let's talk about the WHO. Let's not talk about the other risk stratification. Let's yes. talk about the WHO risk stratification. Uh, modified WHO risk stratifications. There are four classes. Uh, class one, there is no increased mortality and no increased morbidity, like a case of repaired ventricular septal defect. Uh, uh, modified WHO class two will be. Uh, mild increase in mortality and moderate increase in morbidity uh, like in our patient now at, at the present time uh, there is modified WHO class 3 which is severe increase in mortality and significant increase in morbidity that is uncorrected uh, congenital cyanotic heart disease and WHO class 4 that is a contraindication to pregnancy like pulmonary arterial hypertension. Right, thank you. So uh, your patient is in NYHA 2 and modified WHO 2. So, uh, her uh, perioperative uh, adverse events are likely to be low and mortality is likely to be substantially low. Uh, Dr. Parul, we will just uh, stop here before we go into the anesthesia aspects. And, yes, uh, and uh, I would request whether anybody has any questions, so they can either unmute themselves um, or type in the chat. Sir, uh, yeah, so there are a few questions in the chat box. Can I read can them just, out yeah, to you? Yeah, please read so them. So, the out first question you. is. How do you differentiate between aortic stenosis and aortic sclerosis? Okay. See, the question is, uh, aortic sclerosis is usually a precursor to degenerative aortic stenosis. So, in elderly population, the aortic valve is thickened, which is the first step, and that is aortic sclerosis. There will be very minimal increases in the aortic uh, valve, uh, the gradients across the aortic valve. There will be very minimal increases in flow. So, meaning to say, 
that the morphology is altered, the aortic valve cusps are thickened, but there is no uh, uh, hemodynamic uh, uh, significance of that. Whereas the aortic valve sclerosis, uh, it's an ongoing process. So as age progresses, your valves will become more sclerosed. There'll be more calcification and thickening. And at some point of time, once the valve area comes down, then you will start getting the hemodynamic abnormalities like the pressure gradient and other features, increased flow velocities and the symptoms. So this is the essential difference between aortic sclerosis, which is a precursor to degenerative aortic stenosis. When a patient is on aortic sclerosis, it is only a medical management that is indicated. You give statins, you give uh, uh, the uh, uh, anticholesterol drugs and so on and so forth. So uh, apart from the anti antihypertensives, if the patient is having a blood pressure or you give beta blockers. But in aortic stenosis, if the patient is uh, symptomatic, then you will have to uh, either operate, uh, do a surgical aortic valve replacement, or you have to do a trans catheter aortic valve replacement. Thank you, sir. No sir uh, there is another question which says, uh, is preload decreased or we try to maintain the preload in such patients? In which so, patients? In aortic stenosis? In aortic stenosis so, patients. We will uh, come to that question in goals of anesthesia. Right, sir. Sir, is there any role of aspirin? Somebody has asked. Is there any role of aspirin in okay, the, so these patients? Aspirin, uh, so aspirin is, uh, uh, if the patient is having aortic valve, isolated aortic valve disease without any risk for uh, uh, thromboembolism, then probably aspirin, just giving aspirin is probably not indicated. Uh, but aspirin is definitely indicated if a patient is having a prosthetic aortic valve uh, along with uh, along with warfarin. They give, a, they, they give something like a baby aspirin, which is a dose of around 75 to 100 milligrams once a day, which is actually continued up to the perioperative period. So there is a definitive role of aspirin in patients with a prosthetic valve, especially a mechanical valve. But uh, patients with native valve aortic stenosis, uh, the role of aspirin is not very clear. And if it is associated with coronary artery disease, yes, yes then you aspirin. definitely give aspirin. Uh, Sir, so some of our delegates would like you to repeat the ECG changes once yeah, again. Okay. Please, so I will ask Dr. Premangshu to uh, say that and please keep it as lucid and as clear as possible. Uh, there can be uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. There can be left axis deviation. There can be associated uh, atrioventricular blocks. There can be associated arrhythmias and LV strain pattern. ST changes. STT changes. Is it right. clear? Right, sir. Uh, so there is a question. Uh, what are the onset of symptoms? As in? Where, uh, sir, in the pregnant patient, they, most probably the question is, when is the onset of uh, symptoms so and what is the onset? Just what we discussed is that normally uh, in, uh, the changes that occur in pregnancy, the stroke volume increases initially and then towards the uh, later stages, the heart rate increases. So usually the changes are tolerated till a point where the compensatory compensation uh, doesn't allow for the uh, uh, symptoms to be tolerated anymore. And usually these pa patients will mostly become symptomatic towards the third trimester of pregnancy because that is where both the blood volume increases as well as there is maternal tachycardia. So in a patient with AS, both the things are going to uh, exaggerate or worsen the symptoms. So often you will find that uh, pregnancy actually announces the symptoms of valvular heart disease in many patients. So the first time patients, at least in our country, are actually diagnosed is when they are pregnant and when they are in the second or the third trimester because that's the time the maximum increase in the blood volume and the increase in the heart rate, maternal heart rate occurs, which manifests or unmasks the symptoms of the valvular heart disease. So... Uh, so that, that that would be in the second or the third trimester of pregnancy. Right. right. Sir, is there any routine role of BNP in diagnosing patients with dyspnea in pregnancy? No, BNP is, I, so I don't know that. Uh, I, I don't know whether there's a the best evidence to that. But if you ask me personally, BNP is a very costly marker. And patients, uh, we should first go for the simple things, simple assessments. A 2D echocardiogram would discriminate between a cardiac and a respiratory cause of dyspnea very effectively. And uh, so I would leave it at that. BNP is definitely a fancy marker and used in heart failure strategies, but uh, I, I don't think it's indicated for di diagnosing the And BNP will, will only tell you if there is heart failure or not. BNP is not going to tell you the other causes of dyspnea. So uh, if there is a respiratory cause of dyspnea, BNP is pretty much not going to tell you anything about it. So I would not advise anybody to do a BNP for diagnosing dyspnea. So there is another question about aspirin. That can we continue low-dose aspirin in this scenario? Yeah, we can. There is no contraindication to it, especially like, a, like Dr. Bikram said, if the patient has coexisting, not this particular patient, but other subset of patients, if they have uh, 
uh, if they have uh, coronary artery disease, then yes, definitely aspirin can be continued. Uh, see, aortic stenosis is a progressive disease. Whether you give statins or whether you give aspirin, there is no medical management of aortic stenosis. It is only for symptom management. In this particular context, we are managing the symptom with beta blockers and diuretics, which is what most of the patients will get. Aspirin is only for secondary prevention, uh, so it is not going to primarily help in the disease, but where aspirin definitely has a role, I'll re-emphasize that point, if the patient has undergone an aortic valve replacement for aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation, whatever, then aspirin uh, has a role uh, in the management of these patients, and along with warfarin, you can give aspirin. Right. Uh, I think this question is quite clear to almost all our delegates now. So this last question, uh, of, uh, that is, role of cardiac catheterization in such patients? Cardiac catheterization for what? So they've not mentioned it, most probably for relief of symptoms or... No, no, it's just that is it... for measuring the pressures, so measuring the gradients. Yeah. The gradients are jolly well, uh, if I've got the question right, role of cardiac catheterization is only for... So only, only two roles. One is to measure the gradient and the other is if the patient is a patient above 50 years and you want to do a coronary angiogram to see if the patient has coronary artery disease. So that is... That is the only indication of a cardiac catheterization. So if the patient is above 50 with aortic valve disease and scheduled for aortic valve replacement, you do a cardiac catheterization to do a coronary angiogram and see if there is coronary artery disease because the indication of doing AVR plus CABG is at the same setting. Otherwise, right. cardiac catheterization for doing for recording pressures, nobody does it anymore. It's all echo-based unless there is something that is not resolved with echo. Also, uh, some of the questions are regarding the anesthetic considerations, which we, we can take after we discuss. Yes, we will come to that. In case anything has been left, then we'll again come back to the questions. Right, sir. Shall we continue with our discussion, Dr. Parul, with your permission? Yes, sir. Please, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Premansu, so now coming to the anesthesia per se, what are your uh, goals of anesthesia, hemodynamic goals of anesthesia management in this particular patient or a patient with diabetic stenosis? My goal uh, in this patient will be to maintain a heart rate between 50 to 80 beats per minute, to maintain a normal sinus rhythm, to avoid arrhythmia, to maintain adequate preload, to prevent fall in. So you told that to maintain adequate preload. There was a question in the chat box whether preload needs to be decreased or needs to be maintained. So the answer is maintain. maintain. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 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 in the fall in SVR should be avoided. Fall in so let's finish the goals first. One is to one is to avoid the fall in systemic vascular resistance. The other is to avoid a tachycardia. Third is to maintain the preload. Fourth is to maintain normal sinus rhythm. Fifth and rate between six. No, and the contractility. And contractility. So preload, afterload, heart rate, contractility, and rhythm. And, and rhythm. Rhythm is sinus. Heart rate is between sixty and eighty. Avoid tachycardia. Systemic vascular resistance. Please don't drop it. Preload, maintain a preload and contractility, maintain the contract. These are your anesthetic yes. goals. Towards that end, what would be the choices of now this patient, the obstetrician has given a call for um, LSCS for whatever indication. Now, what would be the choices of anesthesia that you can offer to this patient? I can offer both neuroxial anesthesia as well as general anesthesia with multimodal analgesia to this patient, sir. In neuroxial anesthesia, I can either go ahead with a low dose spinal anesthesia along with uh, epidural that is combined spinal epidural anesthesia or a graded epidural anesthesia or else uh, I'll go ahead with general anesthesia with multimodal analgesia. What would you do? For my case, I will go ahead with general anesthesia with multimodal analgesia. Why so? In neuroxial anesthesia, the fall in systemic vascular resistance and preload is very sudden and compensatory mechanisms will take time to uh, develop. So, in general anesthesia, the hemodynamics is in my hand, uh, is more in my hand than neuroxial anesthesia. Uh, I can uh, I can do gradual induction of the case, which will uh, which will prevent abrupt fall in SVR or abrupt fall in uh, preload in cases of general anesthesia. Okay, so the one thing I want to emphasize to the residents here is often, often they get plummoxed when they are asked this question, what would you do, general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia? Now, let me put it across to you convincingly that there are no well-designed randomized trials uh, to address all these questions. It is all from anecdotal case reports or from uh, uh, or from expert opinion. So even if you say that you want to go for a spinal anesthesia or an epidural anesthesia or a general anesthesia, all the answers are right, provided you are able to justify it. Uh, uh, for example, if you go for a spinal anesthesia, 
he said that there is a fall there is likely to be a fall in svr you can counter it by starting a low dose phenylephrine infusion to counteract the fall in svr so there what i want to emphasize here is there is no absolute right or wrong answers how you tailor your anesthesia and how you handle your patient is what determines the outcome it is not the anesthetic per se many times in cardiac discussions uh, i have heard the term that i will give etomidate in a cardiac patient let me tell you i practice cardiac anesthesia day in and day out and we give propofol for all our patients with all types of cardiac disease and there is no mortality because of propofol it is the other things that you do or you don't do that adds up to the mortality so uh, to answer this question all types of anesthesia are safe provided you know how to manage your anesthetic that is the key but coming back to dr premangshu he wants to go ahead with general anesthesia we will take it from there and we will ask him how he will uh, manage his general anesthesia in this particular patient with keeping in mind the hemodynamic targets so would you like to start from your patient uh, pre operative preparation and the monitoring uh, and then the general anesthesia yes sir <clears throat> pre operatively i'll uh, 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 inform the patient about the possible risks involved with so anesthesia. you will do a pre operative counseling you will do a risk stratification you will take consent would you give a pre medication i would avoid a pre medication we will take the pre it depends on the anxiety of the patient but mostly uh, because uh, the labor rooms are often next door to the labor theaters it's a short transit and so we can go ahead with our general anesthetic straight away but what monitoring would you like to establish before you start with general anesthesia i would like to attach ecg non a non invasive blood pressure and pulse oximetry to the patient i'll also be attaching <laughs> ventilator pad to the Uh, i'll also secure one iv cannula and under local anesthesia i'll also secure one arterial cannula and i'll be measuring invasive blood pressure monitoring and after induction i'll also be putting a temperature probe to the patient it is your to and temperature and it is your to how do you induce this patient <clears throat> for induction of this patient i'll be uh, starting with uh, fentanyl iv fentanyl uh, 75 to 100 microgram iv for this patient i'll be giving 100 microgram uh, iv uh, fentanyl followed by uh gradual titrated doses of propofol titrated to response that is loss of verbal response and uh, once as well as the hemodynamics as well as the hemodynamics and uh, once patient is induced i'll check for mass ventilation and after that i'll be giving uh, muscle relaxant to facilitate my uh, intubation i'll be opting for rocuronium for my case uh, rocuronium at 1 mg per kg dose and uh, uh, after that uh, after 1 uh, half minutes after achieving Uh, uh adequate uh, muscle relaxation i'll be intubating the patient with a seven size internal diameter cuffed endotracheal tube and confirm it with etco2 and auscultation will you will you give some aspiration prophylaxis to this patient uh, i would like to give aspiration prophylaxis to this patient uh, uh i'll be giving injection ranitidine 50 mg uh, intravenously as well as injection uh, metoclopramide 10 mg uh, intravenously so here we would like to uh, the other things what he said is routine but one thing that i would like to uh, uh, you know uh, flag up is use of fentanyl now there are many obstetric anesthesia uh, anesthesiologists and obstetrician who will get shocked with the use of fentanyl before the baby is out and there can be neonatal depression and all that but let me assure you that it is the maternal hemodynamics that takes priority please do not go ahead with general anesthesia induction without a small dose of opioid uh you have to inform the you have to inform the neonatologist that uh, they, you are going to give intravenous opioids like fentanyl fentanyl is typically a lipophilic opioid it is short acting even if it has some uh, respiratory depression on the fetus uh, on the baby uh, the neonatologist should be able to manage that uh, using some sort of uh, respiratory assist support so the maternal hemodynamics takes priority and therefore please do not avoid giving an opioid you would give an intrathecal opioid suppose you give a combined spinal epidural analgesia you would be giving a short dose of opioid let's extend the argument to labor analgesia if you give labor analgesia you would be giving opioids so please do not do not desist from giving opioids just by saying now the baby is not out i'll not give opioids that's a wrong answer please take care that if you are going to worsen the tachycardia if you are going to worsen the hemodynamic response the as is going to flare up and the patients can go into acute heart failure in that time and resuscitating the mother is going to be a uphill task so that's that's something that all postgraduates need to understand and uh, put in the back of their minds very clear so sir could we take two three questions which have come up uh, related to this uh, topic yeah, sir uh, 
there's a suggestion that what about rapid sequence induction during this time? Oh, we'll go ahead with the modified rapid sequence induction without a required pressure. That's why we use rho curanium. So giving one milligram uh, per kg of rho curanium will provide you intermittent condition within one to 1.5 minutes. So that is, uh, and we have given aspiration prophylaxis as well. And we do not anticipate any difficult airway in this particular situation as uh, we have done the airway examination, malum particulate was two, mouth opening was adequate. So yeah. yeah, so all these things are answered. The other thing which I want to emphasize is for all the uh, postgraduates, see the question of RSI along with the record pressure is probably outdated. The simple reason a record pressure doesn't work is the esophagus is not located posterior to the trachea. Rather, if you look at all this airway ultrasound that is increasingly coming up, the esophagus is actually to the side of the trachea. So you are giving a cricoid pressure is going to have no effect on the upper esophageal sphincter or the cricopharyngeal junction. So giving that cricoid pressure is absolutely uh, probably a redundant practice which anesthesiologists should start thinking, uh, you know, rethinking about the utility of the cricoid pressure. We're just giving something blindly and uh, there is no, there is no uh, strong evidence for that. So we, we will do a modified RSI without giving the cricoid pressure, gentle back mass ventilation, aspiration prophylaxis, use of proporonium, all these things help in the induction of anesthesia. So uh, that's one thing. And there is some one question about uh, scoline. Is scoline contraindicated? No, scoline is not contraindicated, but we routinely do not use scoline in our uh, routine anesthesia practice. We have rocurinum and we can jolly well go for rocurinum. Suppose rocurinum is not available, there is no absolute contraindication for scoline. Yeah. And I think so will you, a question about dexmedetomidine. Yes, sir. There's uh, so, a question about use of dexmedetomidine to prevent tachycardia. So, so see, you can use any drug. The goal has to be maintained. Goal is rate, rhythm, contractility, preload, afterload. But again, so you can use any drug. There is no special special uh -huh. indication for dexmedetomidine. See, again, it's a it's an individual practice. Right, sir. To answer this question, let us let us ask the question back. Do we have a best evidence for dexmedetomidine in patients with aortic stenosis? We don't. Therefore, if you are going to use dexmedetomidine, you have to jolly well take that decision on your own. Having said that, I would caution the, uh, the practitioners to use dexmedetomidine because many times these patients are on beta blockers. Now, you don't want a dangerous bradycardia to develop bradycardia. which is going to drop the cardiac output. So, yes, if at all your goal is to avoid tachycardia, ensure that the beta blocker has been given, give a low dose fentanyl, all these things take care of the tachycardia nice. Right. Right. So there are two questions. One, which is what is the role of gastric ultrasound for that is, that is assessment? Not part of this uh, discussion. Uh, so right, uh, I think we are just meandering yeah. here. So role of gastric ultrasound, again, there is no convincing. There are a lot of articles that are now coming up that in pregnancy, the gastric ultrasound tells you whether the patient is having a full stomach or not and all that. But tell me, let me ask you the question back. What is the evidence of gastric ultrasound in improving the outcomes in such patients? If you ask, look at aspiration outcomes or any other outcomes, has there been any convincing data to show that if you're not using gastric ultrasound, there is more chance of aspiration? No. So it is again, it is again, and here, here you have to realize that time is a premium. You have already been given a call for LSCS. You do the aspiration prophylaxis business. You may or may not have an ultrasound machine at your disposal. So don't go into the, you know, the, uh, 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 too much into the intricacies of doing a gastric ultrasound and we have done gastric ultrasound. Me and Dr. Bikram have done a lot of gastric ultrasound. It is extremely a user dependent uh, finding. If I do a gastric ultrasound and Dr. Parul, you will do the gastric ultrasound, both of us will have different findings. So, so let us not argue about that. Your voice is cracking. Your voice is cracking. We'll go ahead with the discussion and we'll come back to the questions. Is it okay, Dr. Parul? Right, sir. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Premanso, now you have uh, uh, anesthetized this patient. So, uh, can you tell us what are the causes of hypotension in this particular patient? It can be due to the vasodilatory effect of the anesthetic drugs I have given, or it may be due to autocouple compression in supine position. It may also be due to some arrhythmia which is happening to the patient or it may be due to the blood loss which is happening intraoperative. So how will you manage each, each scenario? Can you tell us? Uh, if First of all, the general measures I'll take is uh, uh, left uterine tilt maintained with a wedge uh, below the right buttock. Uh, we'll give some alicots of uh, fluid and we'll give a little head down position. If uh, even with all this, uh, if the hypotension is persistent and there is no arrhythmia, I'll be going ahead with uh, some uh, phenylephrine. 
50 to 100 microgram bolus, that is vasopressure. And if there are other associated causes of hypotension, evident like arrhythmia, I'll be acting according to that. Why are you worried of arrhythmia? What happens uh, with arrhythmia in a patient with aortic stenosis? In a uh, normal uh, population, the atrial kick uh, 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 gives around 20 to 25% to the uh, LV and diastolic volume. But uh, in aortic stenosis, because of the stiff left ventricle, the <clears throat> atrial kick uh, provides at around 40 to 45 percent of the uh, left ventricular and diastolic volume. So if there is atrial arrhythmia, then this atrial kick will be lost. So there will be very less diastolic filling of the uh, left ventricle and that will in turn. So we can go into an acute heart failure situation. So it is very important, especially when you are putting a central venous catheter, be sure not to allow your guide wire to trigger any sort of arrhythmias because once the patient goes into air, immediately you will have hypotension and it is notorious to resuscitate these patients because remember AS is a fixed output state and once the patient has low, low cardiac output or patient has cardiac arrest, these patients are notorious, uh, difficult to resuscitate. So better to, prevention is always better than treatment. That is the goal in patients with AS. So how will you manage arrhythmia in this patient? Suppose so there is atrial have, fibrillation. Yeah, or you have supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. Can you take us through management of both? Uh, so first, I'll be uh, seeing the uh, hemodynamics of the patient. Uh, if patient is hemodynamically unstable, uh, so I'll be directly going ahead with uh, cardioversion or supraventricular or supraventricular tachycardia. Yeah. AF. AF. And if uh, the patient is hemodynamically stable, then I'll go, uh, go ahead with uh, IV uh, agents. And uh, if that is, uh, if the uh, the arrhythmia is uh, uh, causing uh, severe hemodynamic disturbances, like for example, ventricular fibrillation or any other shockable rhythm, which is there and patient is going into uh, hemodynamic collapse, then I'll be uh, requiring uh, shock for uh, uh, cardio, uh, this thing, uh, defibrillation for this patient, sir. How much uh, in a joules would you use? For I'll that? start with uh, 200. Straight away, start with 200. There's no question about it. Yeah. So if the patient has a cardiac arrest and the rhythm is shockable because you have got the pads on, you can immediately see the rhythm. If the rhythm is shockable, then you will start with uh, a DC shock of uh, 200 joules. Okay. And if the patient is having AF, then you go for uh, 120 joules or something like that for uh, cardioversion. And if the patient is hemodynamic stable, you can go for adenosine or amiodarone depending on the depending supraventricular. Yeah. For the ventricular, you can go for okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you can ask. So now uh, your uh, anesthesia has been very smooth. The baby is now delivered. After uh, the baby is delivered, now you are, uh, the obstetrician has asked you to start oxytocin. So can you tell us how you will give oxytocin to this patient? Uh, first, I'll, uh, after the baby is out, I'll give three units of oxytocin uh, over uh, two to three minutes uh, infusion and uh, followed by three unit per hour infusion. Continued for uh, around uh, three to four hours. So what are the problems that you anticipate with oxytocin in this particular patient? Oxytocin uh, decreases systemic vascular resistance as well as increases heart rate. So again, in turn, it will precipitate symptoms of aortic stenosis. So uh, for the audience, you have to be really very careful uh, while you are giving oxytocin infusion to this particular patient with aortic stenosis because oxytocin can cause uh, myocardial ischemia and AMI intraoperatively. It can cause hypotension and it can worsen the symptoms of aortic stenosis. Okay, now with oxytocin, the, uh, the uterus is not getting contracted and uh, the obstetrician is now requesting to give you something else. So what are your other options for my, prevention of PPH? My other options will be to go ahead with methyl or carboplo carboprost or misoprostol. So what problems do you anticipate if you give methargin to this particular patient? Uh, methargin uh, uh, will, number one, increase uh, uh, blood pressure. Number two, it will also uh, increase the uterine contractility and around 500 to 1 liter of blood uh, will get autotransfused to uh, maternal circulation may precipitate congestion, pulmonary so, congestion. So with methargin, there can be increase in heart rate, increase in blood pressure because of uh, autotransfusion, there can be worsening of the symptoms of aortic stenosis. Okay. This patient has a cardiac arrest. <laughs> uh... How do you manage this patient? And I think there's a good question there. I think Dr. Parul, there's a very good question. Yes, sir. Uh, there is a question. Would you shock first uh, until the baby is out or would you wait till the baby is out to shock? I'll give shock first, uh, even if the baby is inside because maternal priority, uh, maternal life is the priority. Uh, okay. It's an intelligent question. 
because uh, uh, shocking the mother is all if the child uh, the, the, the child is fetus is in situ baby is in situ then you can obviously trigger off a malignant arrhythmia in the uh, in the in the baby so uh, see it's it's tricky i mean so if at all we are worried about this start the cpr get the baby out and then you can shock the patient that's one way of looking at it yes it can be done so so uh, uh, Sir, there was uh, another question for the intraoperative period that what should be the strategy with blood pressure management intraoperatively right. can we handle this question we'll, first we will ask dr premang should answer that question blood pressure management strategy uh, I, I think we have already discussed. We have heard hypertension. You have to mention. Yeah, so let's forward. let's reiterate that point again for the benefit of the audience. Uh, we are already monitoring blood pressure via invasive arterial blood pressure monitoring. Uh, so uh, we are uh, maintaining the preload, afterload, uh, avoid uh, decrease in afterload. The blood pressure management strategy. Let's come to the focused uh, question. Blood pressure management strategy. Yes, sir. Uh, if uh, according to the hemodynamics, uh, I'll be giving aliquots of fluids. If required, uh, then uh, left uterine displacement as well as head down and if required, vasopressors. So uh, if uh, with uh, intermittent doses of vasopressors, it is not helping, then I may start some uh, vasopressor infusion like noradrenaline. No, so I would, I would answer this question differently. What gives the blood pressure is your flow across the valve and your systemic vascular resistance. Therefore, to the blood pressure strategy would be that which maintains, I would maintain the contractility I would maintain the preload and I would maintain the afterload to maintain my blood pressures because blood pressure is ultimately the composite outcome of all these strategies, right? If you look at the equation, the flow into resistance gives pressure. So flow, let's substitute the various terms. The flow is cardiac output. The resistance is your systemic vascular resistance and your pressure is the mean arterial pressure. So unless I'm not maintaining the components on the left side of the equation, like the cardiac output and your uh, systemic vascular resistance, your blood pressure strategy is not going to work. So you need to maintain the cardiac output which means that you need to uh, maintain your preload and the contractility and you need to maintain your systemic vascular resistance that will maintain the blood pressure strategy. Now to give you values, the obviously that you, you need to decide what was the pre-induction pressures and by our conventional teaching, it should always be within 20% of the pre-induction pressures. And if you, want to use drug, if you want to use some drugs for maintenance of uh, blood pressure, then the ideal drug would be a pure alpha agonist. Because like, it will avoid any tachycardia. Absolutely. Like phenylephrine right. or metadaminol, please don't use ephedrine because like I said, ephedrine has also got actions on the cardiac beta receptors and it will increase the heart rate and it can cause, uh, uh, it can worsen the uh, gradient across the aortic valve. Sir, uh, there's a question. Is it safe to use pentazosine for opioid as oh, an opioid could. for pain management? Pentazosine is outdated and nobody, probably nobody is using pentazosine and we are not using, we do not have pentazosine in, in our place. So we we I, routinely use fentanyl. Yeah, I mean, so with all these, fentanyl is a very common opioid that I think is available with all anesthesiologists across the So it could be asked in, a, uh, in the exam, so maybe the student wants to ask. So the next question is, what is safer? So, so let, us, let, us, let us discuss this. I mean, you right. need, so... Pentazosin, I don't think has any great advantage, but maybe you can use it if you don't have any other problem. With pentazosin is it can precipitate uh, acute coronary syndrome. syndrome so yes. that is so the that is avoid patients where you anticipate some, some kind of coronary yeah. symptoms. Not only that, this patient has got a hypertrophic myocardium, and even if the coronary arteries are uh, normal, so you can still precipitate angina symptoms in so, such patients. So, so pentazosin is not a great drug. Yeah, for the sake right. of benefit of the postgraduates, pentazosin is a big no for patient with diabetic stenosis. Right. So the take-home message is no to pentazosin in a patient with aortic stenosis. So the next question is, what is safer, a labor analgesia for normal vaginal delivery or elective cesarean section? Again, uh, the, the uh, decision to go for a vaginal delivery or a cesarean section is as per indication. Most of these patients say, for example, this patient with moderate aortic stenosis, NYHA class 2 or a WHO class 2, it's you can absolutely give a trial of uh, vaginal delivery. There is uh, unless there is some maternal indication or a fetal indication. So the maternal indications will be if the patient has got NYHA grade three or higher, like uh, patient is having LV systolic dysfunction, uh, or if the patient has got uh, significant valvulopathy, uh, like uh, asymptomatic or symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, or if the patient has got any di dilatation of the ascending aorta. If there is aortopathy along with aortic stenosis where there is an increased chance of dissection. So if the ascending aortic dimensions are more than 45 millimeters or 4.5 centimeters, or there are fetal indications. So like uh, you have got an unfavorable lie or an unfavorable uh, placenta, 
uh, and so on and so forth, or a previous LSCS. So, so these are the indications where you would definitely go in for an obstetric LSCS. Otherwise, all these patients can jolly well be managed with vaginal delivery because the blood loss is obviously less in patients with vaginal delivery. Uh, so, um, the, for patients with vaginal delivery, labor energy in such patients, especially in this kind of patients, is always an excellent idea because it con controls the sympathetic surges, it controls the pain, and so on and so forth. And all, targeting all these things are important uh, in the management of patients with uh, with aortic stenosis. Right, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, sir. Uh, next question for the intraoperative: Can carbitocin be used an, as an alternative to oxytocin? Yes, definitely it can be used. It's a safer drug than oxytocin. Many centers uh, directly go for carbocin uh, uh, instead of oxytocin. And definitely. sir, what is the role of flow track monitoring for cardiac output and uh, stroke volume? No, uh, uh, let's, let's, no, no, there is no role. I will, I will uh, be extensively use flow track and stroke volume and all that. But let me not argue for these monitoring. There is absolutely no role. You keep your anesthesia management simple. You look at the blood pressures. Like I said, blood pressure is a derivative of both the cardiac output as well as the systemic vascular resistance. Look at the blood pressures, look at the heart rate, look at the urine output, look at the perfusion indices. If, the, uh, if your patient is spontaneously breathing, anyway, the uh, stroke volume variation and all those things do not work. They only work if the patient is intubated, right? And you don't need these fancy gadgets. You don't need this fancy monitors. At the most, put in an invasive art line catheter that gives you bit to bit monitoring and allows you to make immediate interventions as and when there is hypotension. So that is that is the goal of anesthesia management. So please don't go for all these advanced gadgets. It's, it has no uh, incre it has no improvement in the outcome. The, the, like, you, like the outcome is how you practice anesthesia, how you practice your monitoring is what determines the outcome and not what gadgets you're using for monitoring. So now what happens if this patient develops PPH? How to go about blood and blood products? So PPH is more than 500 mil mils of blood loss is PPH. You have to use the jolly well. You have to use the crash flow trials has shown us that early use of tranexamic acid to build save lives uh, by decreasing the bleeding. So you have to go for tranexamic acid. You have to go for other things like you have to uh, do the, all the steps that the obstetricians do, like the massage and all those things and uh, give blood as and when required. Uh, and uh, hope for the best. And if there is everything else fails, then you have to go for an obstetric hysterectomy. Okay. Uh, so as we're running short of time, can we just finish the discussion and whatever yeah. questions are yeah, uh, yeah, left, almost, I'll take I almost, the I almost come to the last end of the discussion. I just want to ask uh, one question. last question. Dr. Primanshu, no, you will ask the yeah. analgesia part. I will ask one more question. Uh, suppose this patient is having cardiac arrest. Yeah, that's the last question. Yeah. So... Uh, how long do you do the uh, CPR and all before you want to escalate the treatment for cardiac arrest? Sir, uh, in case of maternal cardiac arrest, uh, I'll be continuing CPR uh, and I'll be uh, assessing the patient till for four minutes. And uh, no, no, no. Uh, so let's not talk about that. We are not talking about perimortem CS. We are talking about how long do you give CPR before you want to escalate that. 25 to 30 minutes, I'll continue CPR. After that, if uh, the uh, rhythm is not uh, uh, coming back, then we may initiate eCPR. So ECMO, ECMO CPR, because see, the patients with AF have got a fixed output, small cavity. It is very difficult to resuscitate such patients. So if you are not finding the results in 15 to 20 minutes, call for the ECMO team and start the extracorporeal CPR, ECMO CPR. So that, that would probably make a difference in such patients. Okay. Uh, analgesia, you want oh, to One use? last question. So you told that general anesthesia with multimodal analgesia. So what, what do you mean by multimodal analgesia? And what are your plans for this particular patient? Multimodal analgesia is giving uh, analgesics with more than one mechanism of action. So Quickly tell us the multimodal analgesia you will give because we are running short. Uh, for this patient, I will be giving uh, uh, intravenous paracetamol, intravenous diclofenac, uh, and I will be giving pre-extubation uh, transverse abdominis plane block. And postoperatively, if required, as and when required, I can give some opioid boluses also. Very good. So that's that's all from our side. Yes, uh, we you definitely have to improve CPR and decide perimortem CS. Perimortem CS, by definition, is a baby delivery within the five minutes of the maternal cardiac arrest. Again, see the focus is on maternal uh, life. The goal of perimortem CS is to improve the uh, outcome for the mother. Uh, so the mother always takes priority, and that is how we have to uh, look at it. Right. That's exactly what I said, maternal, maternal outcomes. Yeah. Right. Sir, so, so the next question is, how will you control the tachycardia with oxytocin? And with oxytocin, the second question which has been asked is, how is uh, carbitocin oh, okay. better than oxytocin? 
So the the uh, answer to this question is oxidation is going to cause tachycardia. You cannot do anything to prevent tachycardia. The only thing is you can give a slower infusion of uh, oxytocin. One, I would like to make a point here. See, the maternal hemodynamics will improve considerably once the baby is out. So you need to keep that in mind that once the baby is out and uh, there will be some blood loss and all that, it's actually going to improve the maternal hemodynamics. So there may be a little bit of uh, leeway available with us where the tachycardia is tolerated by the mother. And uh, so you, the one of the ways to mitigate or minimize it is that it can be given uh, very slow. That, that is the way yeah. to minimize the tachycardia. And coming to the uh, uh, bolus dose of oxytocin, even 0.5 units have been shown to be effective in caesarean uh, delivery. So you can go for, with a low dose of uh, 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 oxytocin boluses and slow infusion of oxytocin. That is right, going sir. to prevent tachycardia. So, sir, there's another question which asks you, what is the plan of anesthesia of aortic stenosis patient coming for NORA, like endoscopy? See? So, it depends on your... Uh, so, most of the endoscopies, you, uh, upper GI endoscopies can be done under local and some minimal sedation. Uh, for a lower GI endoscopy, yes, you definitely need some anesthesia, but you can... Well, you can go for a uh, supraglottic device with general anesthesia, keeping all the anesthesia goals in mind. And at no. least have a defibrillator ready with you. Yeah. Wherever you're going for the non-operating room anesthesia, have a defibrillator. Uh, so one of our delegates would like to ask you to explain no. the role of methargin on preload again. Methargin will cause increase in the preload. It is going to cause tachycardia. It is going to cause hypertension. And it is going to cause autologous transfusion of around 500 to 600 ml immediately. So it will worsen the symptoms of aortic stenosis. Is that clear? Right, sir. Uh, I would request the audience to unmute themselves and they can ask the questions directly to sir. We have uh, Naveen Malhotra sir with us. We have uh, Madhuri Kurdi ma'am with us. Uh, Parul, sir, would, uh, Dr. Parul. Rajwa, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Parul, uh, currently I'm driving, but uh, it's very good discussion going on. Dr. Yes, Satyajit Mishra and team, they're doing very good. Uh, mm -hmm. Regarding that uh, oxytocin, the evidence which has been accumulated till date, you can always control the speed of the oxytocin to control in these type of cases the tachycardia. In these cases, speed can be controlled, but there is no methodology in which you can describe this is the particular speed of the oxytocin. Plus, there are other methods also. Uh, Misoprost uh, has been used by the obstetrician for a long time, whether it's a vaginal route or it's a sublingual route, because those can be the reason, those can be the helping uh, medicines which can help to contact the uterus in such cases. So it's not necessary. Sometimes oxytocin, the uh, patient is refractory. The This one, uterine tone is refractory to oxytocin. Then they go to methargin or carbapros. But keeping a simple 200 uh, dose of this uh, mesopros, uh, in the, I think wherever the route, which is uh, applicable, whichever is suitable for the patient as the cerebral obstetrician. So it's a teamwork, <laughs> which really helps in the control of this PPPH. But rest of the discussion was very good. Keep on asking a question, please. That's thank my you, input. Thank you, Dr. Sukhminder, and good evening to Dr. Naveen Malhotra, sir. <laughs> so, do we have, uh, sir, we have a few more questions. One is, uh, uh, can you perform, is there any indication of doing an AVR along with the cesarean section? Yeah, so there are some indications. One is refractory medical therapy, especially when the patient has come in the last trimester of pregnancy. So you can offer uh, along with, along with uh, you asked whether along with the CS, you said? Along with the CS. Yeah, yeah. So you can offer, you can offer both, uh, you can offer both the things. You can actually offer the transcatheter aortic valve replacement, but for a young patient, uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement would mean that this patient, uh, the valve would wear and tear off in another, in maybe, uh, in maybe five to seven years time or within maximum a decade. So again, they would require another transcatheter aortic valve replacement. That's that's the reason why it's not very popular in young women. So still surgical aortic valve replacement is done, knowing fully well that there'll be uh, anticoagulation. So yes, uh, once one of the many, many cases are there where the medical management has failed. And so the uh, woman or the pregnant lady has to be given the choice of a surgical aortic valve replacement uh, along with the delivery of the uh, baby. So that's that's definitely an option. 
Yeah, in the chat box, uh, somebody has asked whether uh, endoscopy can be done with a supraglottic device. Yes, definitely it yeah. can be done. Yeah, upper endoscopy usually you do under local. And there are specialized uh, uh, supraglottic devices now available for endoscopy. you can put the endoscopy also. So Dr. Rajiv, I think Dr. Rajiv was asking this question. Yes, yeah. sir. Dr. Rajiv has asked this question. The principles, I would like to emphasize, it's the principles. The principles don't change just because the operating room has changed to a non-operating room. Even though the stimulus may be less, it's still enough to precipitate, uh, you know, heart failure symptoms or arrhythmia or hypertension in these patients. Therefore, the principles of anesthetic management and the hemodynamic grid that we discussed, that is maintenance of the preload, maintenance of the afterload, maintenance of the contractility and the minimization of the tachycardia. These are the overriding goals. Whatever mode of anesthesia you're going for is, chat down, is not chat, chat down. going to make a difference unless you don't uh, keep these things uh, in mind. If you're not keeping these things in mind, whichever uh, anesthesia you're you are doing is going to be fruit, fruitless. So, so the next question is, what can we do to improve the cardiac output during CPR in aortic stenosis patient as it is a low cardiac output state? That's what, it that's is, what it is difficult. Yeah. So that's why there is an indication for early uh, eCPR, that means ECMO CPR. So you put the patient on a V ECMO, that is a venoarterial ECMO, and uh, you keep the ongoing CPR because it's very difficult to improve the cardiac output in a patient because you see the the heart, the LV is a very small LV because the radius has come down because of the pressure, uh, this thing, uh, increase in the pressure of, uh, gradient. The radius of the ventricle has come down. So you are not going to be able to give any kind of effective cardiac output. AS is a notorious disease where once the cardiac arrest happens, you need to go in for an early institution of uh, extracorporeal CPR. So what, are, uh, what anything you would like to comment on the extubation? And indications for post-operative elective uh, ventilation. So elective ventilation is if the patient has been in heart failure symptoms uh, in higher grades of NYHA, then definitely a trial of elective uh, ventilation would be important. At the same time, you need to understand that uh, you, you need to establish a bonding between the mother and the baby also. Uh, so the, you, need to, you need to keep that consideration in mind. But yes, the maternal indication would be for an elective CS would be a patient in advanced heart failure or advanced modified WHO uh, stage. Uh, where it would be better to give a short trial of ventilation and see how the patient's hemodynamics and other parameters improve before you take a decision on extubation. Uh, and what are the, what other question you asked? So, what are there any specific uh, you know plan for extubation? Extubation, yeah. No, no specific. You plan. have to make it yeah. smooth. Yeah. You have to. So, uh, like extubation, you, yeah. you are keeping your, the goals in mind. About the yeah. about, so, uh, give the drug slowly because uh, you if you give glycopyrrolate and all those things can also precipitate tachycardia. So, give it slowly. Uh, allow the patient to have a gentle extubation, make sure that the patient is pain-free, patient is not having uh, hypothermia or anything, so avoid shivering because that will precipitously increase the myocardial oxygen consumption and the worsen the outcomes in a hypertrophied heart. So keep your principles of extubation simply simple, a warm patient, a comfortable patient, uh, good pain management, yeah. and uh, slow titration of the drugs for extubation. And sir, can supraglottic airway devices be used in cesarean section if the patient is fasting? Uh, see, uh, uh, there are no specific guidelines for use of supraglottic airway devices for patients who, who, who are undergoing a uh, cesarean section. But yes, it can be used if the patient is fasting. There is no uh, so, contraindication for use so, of a supraglottic so, device. So it all depends. If you are doing a high risk case, uh, then it's always better to have a more controlled Fixed. airway. Yeah. Right? Yes. If you are doing a low risk case, all these things can jolly well work. But if you ask me personally, uh, I, I would not say there is any great advantage of putting in a supraglottic airway device in a patient with aortic stenosis. I can tell you, well, put in an endotracheal tube and have a better control of the airway in case any adverse event happens. Then at that time, you would be rushing to take the LMA out, put in an intubation, uh, do an intubation, and so on and so forth. Right, sir. So, what is the dose of anesthetic uh, which you will give for a subarachnoid block? Okay, Premon, sir. Uh, sir, I'll uh, go ahead with uh, 5 to 8 milligram of hyperbaric 0.5 percent. So, low dose of opioid with 25 micrograms of fentanyl. Start with always go for an epidural to uh, tighter dose of epidural to increase the, uh, to uh, reach a dermatoma level of T4. That's how you, uh, if I'm going for a neuroaxial blockade, that, that's how I will go for it. So, the uh, uh, the teaching here is do not go for a subarachnoid block alone. Combine it with a uh, with a epidural uh, anesthesia so that you avoid the hypotension and the drop in the sphere. So, in continuation with this, somebody has asked, can you give only epidural because this is a moderate aortic stenosis? Absolutely, you can. You can. Yes. yes. Uh, so, there's another question uh, which says, uh, how ECMO 
CPR helps in cardiac arrest. Can it increase the cardiac output? No, so ECMO is basically taking over the role of the percussion of the patient. No? So when you are putting a patient on a VA ECMO, you are allowing the machine to do the job of the percussion as well as the ventilation. Therefore, it's no more the heart that has to, you know, sort of do it, allow the heart to recover or allow the heart to rest and uh, continue with your CPR efforts and uh, see whether the heart recovers. So once you, once you take off the load of the percussion and the ventilation from the heart and the lungs and let the machine do it, then uh, that's a great uh, favor done to the heart. Right. Sir, is there any drug specific which you will rec uh, recommend for curtailing or attenuating the extubation response? You can try uh, a titrated dose of beta blocker at the end and uh, short acting beta blocker can be given. Uh, don't give nitroglycerin because again, it will drop the preload as well as the afterload or even so SNP is also contraindicated for that purpose. Give a short acting beta blocker, esmolol just around the peri extubation period. If uh, you are worried too much about the tachycardia, uh, what about lignocaine? Would you yeah, give yeah, lignocaine? Yeah, you yeah, can yeah, give lignocaine yeah. also to yeah. plant the hemodynamic response to extubation. But uh, keep in mind that lignocaine can, can, can cause hypotension and delayed awakening. So these are the two things that can be uh, aggravated by lignocaine. So you can give a short acting beta blocker if you are very worried about the tachycardia. But like I said, the maternal hemodynamics will improve once the baby is out. Right. Uh, we have Dr. Madhuri ma'am with us. Ma'am, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, good evening. Good evening for a very excellent, uh, congratulations for a very excellent and elaborate case discussion. Uh, this is for the presenter. What if the patient, uh, what if your patient had a prosthetic aortic valve? How would you manage? If my patient is having a prosthetic aortic valve, first of all, I'll uh, inquire about the anticoagulant, what uh, uh, C is on. Uh, uh, depending on the anticoagulant, I'll also be opting for bridging uh, if required for elective caesarean. And uh, uh, anyway, we are going ahead with uh, general anesthesia uh, with uh, multimodal analgesia for my patient. Uh, even if, uh, 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 even if uh, the patient is on anticoagulant and uh, being continued on it and adequate time, time period is not available. And uh, so what I think ma'am wants to ask is which trimester you would give what drug in a patient with a prosthetic? Okay, so uh, in first trimester, uh, warfarin can be given. Uh, from second trimester, uh, warfarin cannot be given because of its teratogenicity. But uh, during second and third trimester, warfarin can be given. But recent evidence says to continue with LMWH from the very beginning. And at 36 weeks of pregnancy, we need to convert, uh, we, we need to stop warfarin. Uh, if being used, we need to convert it into LMWH till 48 hours before the planned uh, delivery and convert it into unfractionated heparin. And it will be continued till four to six hours before the planned uh, uh, procedure. And once the baby is out, once the procedure is done, after four to six, weeks, uh, four to six hours of that, we can again uh, uh, restart the unfractionated heparin. Yes, very good. So that means throughout the pregnancy, a lot of counseling is needed. And uh, in fact, I think prenatally only surgical correction is advised for severe aortic stenosis, isn't it? Before conception itself. Yes, ma'am. And uh, here I would just like to add the concept of the pregnancy heart team. That is, it's a collaboration between the cardiologist, the obstetrician, the anesthesiologist, and the cardiothoracic surgeons. So they all collaborate and take care of the patient throughout the pregnancy and delivery. And that will lead to good, uh, good uh, post-pregnancy outcomes. There's a concept of yeah, uh, yeah. pregnancy heart team. Okay. 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 Congratulations once again for a very good presentation. Thank Both you. the Thank chairpersons you. and the student. Thank, Thank you. We have Dr. SL is asking. Dr. Right, SL is asking, Dr. SL is asking if uh, there is an emergency and the patient is taking warfarin, whether to go for FFP or vitamin K. See, vitamin K will take time for antagonizing the cell. Right? So in any emergency, you have to give FFP. Or PCC can also be given. Is it clear, Dr. SL? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, may I request Dr. Naveen Malhotra, sir, to please uh, say a few words to enlighten the audience? 
excellent discussions and excellent case presentations. Uh, really, it was nice listening to both uh, the chairpersons and the speaker and very rightly said about the anesthetic goal standards. And bottom line is you have to maintain status quo. Nothing mm -hmm. has to decrease, nothing has to increase, whether it is preload, afterload, heart rate and criticality. Uh, here come the skills and challenges of an anesthesiologist to maintain the status quo. And all the other uh, things discussed, whether the patient is coming for emergency, LSCS, or on warfarin, uh, all are uh, evidence-based. So it was pleasure listening to the student also and nicely moderated by the chairpersons. Artist, congratulations. Thank you so Thank much, you, sir. With, with just a smile and a few words, you have summarized the entire discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sir, we have still a few questions left. So we'll just take the last two questions and uh, then we'll wind up the session. So the last question is, how many units of FFP do you advise if the one patient was on board? One, one to two, two units. units. And uh, the last question, which we'll take up for the session is, please repeat the anticoagulation plan again. Yeah, Rima, so you can. Okay, make it clear and yes. Okay. Uh, so first, our trimester, Warfarin is contraindicated. So first trimester, we'll use LMWH. Then from 13 weeks to 36 weeks, we can give Warfarin. After 36 weeks, we'll convert it into LMWH. And that is till 48 hours before the procedure. From at 48 hours, we'll repeat one PTNR. And also at that time, we'll convert it into UFH, that is unfractionated heparin. And it will be continued till four to six hours before the procedure. Now the procedure is done. And after four to six hours of that procedure, again, we'll restart unfractionated heparin. Okay, I'll, I'll just, uh, for a little bit of detailed discussion, I will uh, add on something. something. So a patient, patient with a prosthetic heart valve, I think there's an echo, so somebody needs to mute. Uh, uh, Dr. Paro? Yes, sir. If you can mute sir, yourself. Sir. Yeah. So for a patient with a prosthetic heart valve, we are worried about uh, valve thrombosis. And we know that pregnancy is a procoagulant state, right? So how do we manage the anticoagulation? Now, uh, it depends on what valve the patient has. So if you have a mitral, uh, prosthetic heart valve in the mitral position, you would need a higher anticoagulation, say, uh, uh, say an uh, uh, INR of uh, may, maybe around uh, 2.5 or more than that. Whereas if you have a prosthetic valve in the aortic position, you would need a lesser anticoagulation because the flow is, uh, you know, the cardiac output is better and uh, it's not a low flow like uh, that happens in the AV valves. So if your warfarin requirement is less than 5 mg per day, at the risk of sounding preposterous, you can continue with the warfarin even in the first trimester of pregnancy, okay? But if the warfarin requirement is more than 5 mg per day, it is safe to switch over to either a low molecular weight heparin or to uh, 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 unfractionated heparin. Now, unfractionated heparin is cumbersome to give and you need to monitor APTT. You need to monitor APTT and you need to keep the APTT twice the baseline APTT. Uh, low molecular weight heparin is excellent. You can give twice a day dosing and you don't need to monitor anything. But suppose you do need to monitor, monitor the uh, anti tna activity because that acts on the factor 10. So you need to monitor the anti tna activity four to six hours after the last dose. And you need to see whether it's 0.6, 0.8 to 1.2, or some say that up to 1.5, 1.5 international units per ml. So that is your type code. But let me emphasize again that you don't need to monitor anything if you're putting the patient on low molecular weight heparin, which is why it works great. And in the outpatient setting. So, uh, if, so if, but for the postgraduates, I would advise you not to answer that you can give warfarin if it's in a dose of less than five milligrams. Avoid the use of warfarin altogether in the first trimester of pregnancy. Say that you will go for low molecular weight heparin twice a day daily dosing. Between 12 and 36 weeks, you can convert back to warfarin, but please remember that warfarin is not all that safe. It can cause IUGR, warfarin embryopathy even in between 12 and 36 weeks. Now, so many uh, consensus, many international guidelines are now coming where they say that you give, you continue with the uh, low molecular weight heparins, but you can give warfarin. Now, after 36 weeks, you need to again switch off warfarin because of the risk of bleeding perioperatively or during the vaginal, uh, uh, the single, uh, during normal delivery and all that. So what you do is you switch back to LMWH, but you make sure that uh, 48 hours before the last, uh, before the expected date of delivery, you go over to unfractionated heparin because if you're giving twice a day uh, dose of uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin, the action will last for at least 24 hours. 
so you need to switch over to the unfractionated herbarium, maybe around four to six hours before the plant uh, delivery. So uh, you again, how do you do that? You maintain the APTT at uh, twice the uh, normal uh, normal baseline, and four to six hours before the plant delivery, switch off the uh, unfractionated herbarium, allow the delivery to go through, and then again restart the unfractionated herbarium. Uh, as soon as the, uh, as the as soon as the mother stabilizes, because you need to prevent the prostatic valve thrombus. Because once the prostatic valve thrombus comes in, then you are asking for trouble. Uh, after that, once the mother stabilizes in the perioperative period, then you can start warfarin. Warfarin is not excreted in the breast milk, so it will not cause any problems to the baby after that. So I hope that's. Thank you so much, sir. And if you could see the chat box, it is just filled with compliments and uh, praises for both this speaker as well as the eminent chairpersons. So, sir, can we close the session with your permission? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, pleasure. everyone. It was Thank a pleasure you. to have you on board with us. And Thank it was you. a great session. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Parul, 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 let me say something. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Satyajit and Dr. Bikram, it yes, was sir. really yes, a pleasure listening to your PG and uh, all the support you provided. That's why right. I think majority of the questions being asked in the Viva have almost been answered properly. And Thank more you. than that, I think uh, whatever the, I think whenever the people get entrapped in the examination, no blunder has to be done. And you have done absolutely perfect to answer each and every query in a very elaborative way. It was very absorbing discussion. Although I was driving, but you know, <laughs> I was glued to the, my, this one uh, speaker. It was Thank wonderful. You. And so what I can see, perceive from here, the take-home message is that in such cases, they should be done in the tertiary care institutions. No, no doubt about that. Any anesthetist who is in the practice, in the practitioner, they should be very, very careful. And only if they are confident having the resources at their disposal, they should get these cases done in those centers. Otherwise, they should be referred and the initial part only. The obstetrician, if the having obstetric case with aortic stenosis, anesthesiologist should be involved from the very beginning rather than just on the table. I think yeah. these are yeah. the very good things. And the one thing we always talk about the multidisciplinary team approach, helping each other. But what you told today that all these things anesthetists have to be prepared for that because nobody comes to the OT. You no cardiologist comes to the OT. No, any other physician comes to the OT when these things happen. It is a perioperative physician, that is anesthesiologist, who is handling these cases. And the best person is a cardiac anesthesiologist. So I think you absolutely right. The message Kevin, was very clear. Stick to the basic plan of anesthesia. And that's more the, rather than going to the adventurous and uh, uh, enhanced gadgets. Those are not going to improve the outcome in these type of cases. It's the basic plan and all the vigilance. Really is nice and absorbing. Uh, it enriched me also to some points, which I really invite from your discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. much. You, you, so you are humble as always, Dr. Bajwa. So you will always say good things. But uh, it's it's uh, it's really an honor to be presenting in this ISA forum. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Malhotra, uh, Professor Bajwa, and uh, for giving us this opportunity for this presentation. It was really uh, informative and uh, learning for us also. And uh, I hope we have done justice to, to this event. Definitely, definitely. Really, thank very, very uh, heartily thanks to you people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Parul, you can now formally close the uh, this one class. And I can only say from my side, long live ISA. Long live ISA. Thank you so thank much, you. everyone, for thank joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And with your permission, we close the session. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone, for joining us today.
the technical team to 